الإناء ينضح بما فيه. It's a proverb in Arabic that my father often reminded me of, and it means a vessel can only pour from that which it contains within it. If your vessel is filled with goodness, you pour goodness. If it's filled with blessings and beauty, you pour blessings and beauty. But if it's filled with something else, then you have no choice but to pour for the people that come to you what it is that you have within your vessel. For the past 15 years, my life has been dominated by terrorism. I have touched this topic from every possible angle from legal, philosophical, and religious reform, all the way to job creation and creating opportunities for young people to be integrated into the societies within which they live. The difference between me and the vast majority of Muslims around the world is not that our heart breaks every day that there is an act of terrorism. It's not that I begin to lose my confidence in who we can be as a people contributing to the greatness of society. It's that I must wake and look at my family and go on television to answer and to explain and to guide. When I was a young man, I did that solely based on adrenaline. I did it solely based on love. I did it solely based on my optimism for what the future could be. But about a year ago, I hit a wall and I hit it hard. I began to lose faith. Faith in myself, faith in our cause, faith in my community. And I looked to the world around me to find a way to reconcile the proposition that my vessel was empty. I came to the painful realization that this is not the work of counterterrorism. This is not the work of economic development. This is not the work of fighting ugliness with intelligence. It's the work of pouring hope. It is the ability to articulate a vision that represents the untested feasibility of who we can be as human beings on this earth. And my painful realization was that I was out of hope. And so I searched for it. And I searched for it in places that others would find trivial, that others would find as, you know, cute, but not really the place where you're going for that hard-hitting ethics, for those hard-hitting philosophical concepts. I went to the world of graphic novels and the world of comic books. And in these books, for the past 11 months, I have regained hope. I have regained my belief in the world. I have regained my belief in the untested feasibility of who we can be as people. And so what I'm going to do is share five stories simply, directly, to invite you to enter with me into a world in which you and I both believe that we can come about hope in the midst of ugliness and tragedy. The first story I'd like to share with you is Pride of Baghdad. Pride of Baghdad is the story of a family of lions in the Baghdad Zoo upon the 2003 invasion of Iraq. In this story, we take metaphor to the next level. We see the vision of youth. We see the wisdom of age. We see the hope for the future. We see difference of identity, difference of perspective, despite the sameness of situation. We see in a way that jumps above our political ideas, that jumps beyond what we want to see in the world that is similar to us. We see beauty in the authentic experience of the people of Iraq upon the destruction of their society. And we see it through the use of metaphor I then stumbled upon a graphic novel that spoke to me in a great way. It's entitled Cairo. Cairo is a hilarious depiction of who we can be as human beings. It's the story of a man named Ashraf. Ashraf in Arabic means the most honorable one. 
Ashraf's job is that he sells hashish, the North African equivalent of marijuana. And it just so happens that in Egypt, if you want to get the really good hashish, you have to go all the way to Sinai, and Sinai is on the border with Israel. Now, I only know that from folklore. I don't know that from personal experience. <laughs> and so we find the story of Ashraf, who on his way from Sinai back into the city goes to the safe house of a drug lord and steals from that drug lord a hookah. In this hookah is a genie named Shems. Shems in Arabic means the sun. And he sells this hookah to a Lebanese American tourist who is in Egypt for the first time. And all of a sudden, the Lebanese American tourist engages the hookah and out comes the genie. And so we enter this epic story of a love affair between an Egyptian hashish seller and an Israeli intelligence agent. And we see a young woman from Orange County, California, who learned Arabic in college because she said she wanted to learn an anti-imperialist language and engage the world. And so this coterie of people who would otherwise never come together embark upon this magnificent journey to save this honorable genie from the incursions of a drug lord. It brings to fruition the crazy idea that each of us can come together to change our reality in a way that's not consistent with how we thought we could change it before we started working together. I'd like to tell you the story of Sam Wilson who grew up in Harlem, the son of a preacher man. At a very young age, Sam Wilson lost hope in the society within which he lives very soon after that, his mother passed away. Over the course of his life, he became an adventurist, a scientist. In fact, he became the first black superhero in American history. His name was Falcon. Recently, when Captain America's powers dissipated because he could no longer keep himself youthful, he chose Falcon to become the next Captain America. Yes, that's right. Captain America is black. And if you think that doesn't matter, then you are likely not responsible for the upbringing of a young black man in the society within which we live today. Just to make sure that you don't think all black men are the same, let me tell you the story of Black Panther. What if I presented to you the idea that the most technologically advanced country on the face of the earth is the African nation of Wakanda? Its spiritual head is also its head statesman. He is also an international superhero. His name is Chala, known as Black Panther. He is an African married to an American superhero named Storm. And his story gives us a richness that the public discourse that you and I are involved in as it relates to race and identity does not have. It offers us texture. It offers us nuance. We see African Americans in D.C. coming to cheer for Black Panther as he meets with President Obama in the White House. In a 2011 version of Black Panther, he goes up against this guy, American Panther, the superhero of the KKK. This is a rally in which they are lamenting the presence of these Arabs and these Mexicans and these Africans and these homosexuals in our society. They drape banners across the police precinct walls that say, embrace hate, America for Americans. And so the reader is dealt the reality that we live, the texture that exists, the layering that exists in the society within which we are all attempting to exist. But I found hope in one comic more than any other comic. And it took me to a place personally and ethically that I never thought I could be before. This is the story of Kamala Khan. She is a Muslim American from a Pakistani American family and she is 16 years old. The first time that we see Kamala, we see her eyeing an easy, greasy bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich at the local convenience store. Now, if you don't know American Muslims, you should know that this is actually something that many of us do. 
And that's why when Muslims who are from the West travel to Muslim-majority societies, the first story they tell when they come back is the meat lover's extra pepperoni pizza that they ordered in their hotel room. We've always been curious. Kamala's best friend is a Turkish-American young lady who used to be called Kiki, but now would prefer that you refer to her by her appropriate name, Nakia. The boy that she has a crush on, his name is Bruno. He works at the local convenience store. Kamala is an authentic human being. Her mother is always worried about her being online on those Avengers fan pages trying to drop as many quotes as possible. And her father is always questioning her brother as to whether his extreme form of religiosity might be just an excuse for not wanting to go out and find a job. <laughs> a lot of people assume that Muslims don't like dogs. Well, Kamala Khan, Ms. Marvel, she has a dog that has come to her from heaven. He has a tuning fork in his head, and that allows him to teleport Kamala from place to place. In a scene that captured my heart, that spoke to the reality of Muslims in America as I know them in their beauty, Kamala, for the first time, decides to act as a superhero. And she thinks about jumping in upon seeing two of her friends from high school drunk on a pier, and the girlfriend falls into the water. And Kamala ponders upon something that her father once told her. He said that in the Quran, God says that if you kill an innocent life, it is as if you have killed all of humanity. But if you save one innocent life, it is as if you have saved all of humanity. Kamala Khan is something different. Ms. Marvel allows us to see the reality that the Muslims of America live every day as superheroes. Because we, as a people, are committed to changing the reality of ugliness that exists in this world by helping each other build a critical consciousness that induces a self-awareness that catapults us, each and every one of us, to a more authentic representation of who we are. I am not in the counter-terrorism business. I am in the hope business. And I thank Ms. Marvel for reminding me of that. No matter how much beauty we attempt to evoke in this world, there will always be ugliness. How we engage it determines our beauty. Thank you.